All right. Good afternoon. Happy Thursday. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy ha Hanukkah. Happy holidays to anybody who's joining us today. My name is Rob Romanowski. I'm the Director of Sales Operations for 3HTI, and we have a fantastic webinar scheduled for you right now. So we have Paul Dye, who is a Solutions Consultant and Applications Engineer with PTC's Virtual Center of Excellence. And what Paul's going to do today is he's going to go through a couple of things within Creo. One, he's going to show you an overview and a little bit of a demo with Mechanism Design, which is a standard feature within Creo. And then he's going to talk a little bit more about mechanism dynamics, which is part of the kinematic and dynamic motion analysis, um, or a part of that extension, which is available for Creo. So if you have any questions, feel free to type those into the uh, Q&A box. This demo today is going to take a little longer than normal. Usually we're around 20, 22 minutes. Today, I think we're going to probably be about 30 with Q&A. So Paul, if you are ready, we can see your screen and take it away, my friend. All right. Thank you very much, Rob, for having me on. And thank, thank you, you everybody else for joining the webinar. I mean, this is essential to almost every design that you see out in the industry today, right? Almost everything that you build has some type of movement mechanism to it. So we need to be able to understand that. And I can go through and explain exactly how we take that into account in Creo. So first and foremost, what I want to do before I jump into anything is I want to talk through just some of the basic challenges that we see out in the industry. And you see some design models that don't move, maybe a building or something like that. That's fine. You can just put the parts together, say this one goes on top of that one. And that's really the way that it works out in the real world. But we also have a lot of designs that do move. Most designs that we work on have some sort of moving component to them. And we need to be able to take that into, into account. It adds a lot of complexity, so many different challenges that traditionally people just aren't very well equipped to deal with. And when our CAD designs, they work well on the computer, but that's not the real world. It's still a virtual design. And if your engineers are still assembling things that are supposed to move using things like fixed constraints, well, you're probably missing out. You know, the truth of the matter is you don't just have one part sitting on top of the other. You have things like pin joints, you have sliders, you have all the movement from one part of the assembly to another. And we need to be able to take that into account. And really the best designs actually take those mechanisms and work that into part of the design exploration as you're going through and building out these components. So taking into account the kinematic, the dynamic behavior of how a model is going to move, that's important. And it makes it, it really gives us the ability to make a better design the first time around. And one thing that a lot of people do is just build a prototype, right? Just to realize that, hey, a component that we built into this, that doesn't work. And then you build another prototype and then you build another one because you're trying to figure out a certain linkage. You're trying to figure out a frame, what sizes that you need. Well, that's a lot of time. And for a lot of people, that's a lot of money that you put into that. And the process also gives you something that simply just works. It's not necessarily the best design, right? And that's what we're trying to do with this. It's really trying to get the best designs out of this. So with this, and really to combat a lot of these challenges, we have solutions from within Creo to work with these designs. And there's two of them I'm gonna to cover today. So first of which is the mechanism design capabilities that are standard from within Creo Parametric. These are your tools right in Creo for simulating your mechanisms, looking at ranges of motion, checking for interference, and integrating those capabilities in with your assemblies. And then we're gonna look at the mechanism dynamics option. So MDO, this is an extension that gives you extended capabilities to, to design and test the mechanisms that you're creating. And now we're gonna be looking with that more around the forces and the accelerations that are created from those moving components in the assembly. So that's taking into a, account a lot more things like springs, motors, friction, gravity, so I'll touch on all that. And first and foremost, I just want to give a quick overview of what we're going to see from a mechanism design standpoint. And at the highest level here, it's giving us the ability to define mechanisms. It's not just putting things on top of one another, but defining how they're going to work out in the real world. You know, things like pins, sliders, joints. And once you have those components put together into a mechanism, it's about running analysis, dragging components around, applying motors to drive them over a certain time frame. It's not just the size and the shape of the models, but have the motion of the components really integrated into the design in of itself. And everything that we're doing is still right from within Creo. It's just available right at the top of your screen, which gives us all the same capabilities that we have to use in the assembly. So completely integrated in there. And the actions that we're all taking there are real time. You can drag components around and based how 
I have my design built out with those, everything can move in accordance with that. Also takes into account interference detection. If you have a prototype all built out in the real world, that's probably a bad time to figure out that you would have an interference. It's much better to be able to do that simulation from right within Creo, take a model through its full range of motion, and then see if you're going to have any issues in that sense. Area claim is another big area here. <laughs> and the creation of things like motion envelopes are features of mechanism design. So you can take a look at the area that a part moves, go ahead and visualize that and have that area that you can pull into other areas of your design process. We can also use things like trace curves to help to see as a part's moving on its path, make a curve along that path. It helps us to see the extents of that movement, allows us to build around that, build off of it, a lot of different options in that sense. And then everything that we build and analyze, it gets saved all those different pin joints, ball joints, they just become part of the assembly. It's not a separate thing, not a separate world. It simply just gets built and saved in with the assembly and something that you can reference back to later on. All right, so that's just a quick overview of working with the mechanism dynamics capabilities in Creo. So we're building out designs for how they're gonna work in the real world. And what I can do now is switch over first and foremost, and I'll take us through a quick demo of what that's going to look like from within the context of Creo. And then I'll go through and switch back and then talk a little bit more and show some of the mechanism dynamics capabilities. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump into it here with our model. So for our demonstration, we're going to be working on a pretty large assembly here that we have for a turbine system. You see that we have a lot of different components going on here. And what we'll do is take a quick closer look into some of them. Let's first start by hiding the structure assembly that goes around the whole thing and take a look at some of the different mechanisms that we have here. So you can see that we have some blades, we have some different supports. It's all attached to a door, like we can see up at the top there. Now the first model that I wanna take a look at here is the linkage to the door. So I'll go ahead and start by opening up that subassembly. Now this is a hydraulic dampening linkage. So it means that we have these two center pieces that move against another. Um, we can go ahead and open that up to see how that's assembled. And think about how people would typically do this. You might just do a coincident mate along the axis or maybe concentric along the faces and then do another coincidence to have it all the way in. But right now it's kind of just stuck there. You could maybe do a dis distance mate specify how far in or out it is, but that doesn't account for what's happening out in the real world, right? Right now, it can just kind of go as far or shorter as I want. So what I'm going to do here is delete that. And now what I want to use instead is a slider constraint, because that's really what's happening here. So with this, make sure that the slider is centered, it's aligned, and now you can go through and put your different translation constraints to it. Now to do that, what I'm going to do is use a plane that we have here, and we'll tell the system that it aligns to a certain face on the edge of my part. And now what that's going to give us is the same type of constraint as before, but now this is really going to be useful going forward. Around that, you have different values and parameters that you can go through and apply to that slider. I can go back into my full linkage here and use the drag components feature. And it works just how I think it would, but right now it's just moving along that axis and it's still moving anywhere that it wants. But that's one of the nice things that we have here now with the slider is I can take a step back here and put in some minimums and maximum limits for where those components can move. So we could set maybe the minimum to zero. And let's go ahead and just give that a value of 30 as well for its maximum. And then you can see that it's not going to go outside of the bounds that we set for it. So really adding in some design intelligence into the model. You can see if I drag my cursor outside of that, it's not going to go outside of those bounds, but it can go anywhere from within it. And same thing up here with my clevis. So right now we just have a couple of coincident mates here lined out and it's not really doing what I want it to do. So instead what I'll do is delete the standard constraints that we have there and instead use one of the connections that we have laid out here from our list. So a lot of different options with that, depending on whatever my particular scenario calls for. In this case here, let's go ahead and use a pin joint, basically say where we want it to align. And we'll have that to our pin to the center axis. And now it can only move up and down there. And finally, we'll go ahead and define the translation of that pin joint. And we're good to go right there. And now what we have is a real life pin joint. The system understands that behavior. Every other component can move right along with it. So anything that's meant to be fixed, you could just use your standard constraints, but 
if it's meant to move, then we can instead use our mechanism constraints. Now, we've made all these changes, but what does that mean back in my main assembly? Well, let's go ahead and stop back over there and regenerate for the different changes that we made. And so here, what we might want to do is try dragging some things around. So if I wanted to, say, for example, move the turbine, how are all of my other components going to react to that? Well, based on how I define that linkage and the pin joint, we can see that everything reacts. Looks pretty good. And we also have the idea of snapshots here. So at particular moments in space, what you could do is take a snapshot and remember that particular configuration. So right now we have it closed, so we might want to call that our closed snapshot. And then from there, we can drag it open and take another snapshot. So easy enough for that one, just call it open. And what you're able to do from that point is simply toggle between the different snapshots and allows me to set the assembly however I need to position it. All right, let's go ahead and add in some more intelligence here. We can open up the assembly for our actuator, the piece that actually pushes this whole thing open. This is a hydraulic piece that we're working with here. And maybe we've already gone through and done a little bit of work with it. We've put on a slider joint like we saw earlier with the linkage. So it's moving the way that I want, but instead of me just dragging this, what I want to do is define a mechanism for that piece. So here, using these mechanism design capabilities, we have all the features for defining and analyzing the mechanisms that we're creating here. So you can see we have a dedicated model tree for our mechanisms, all the conditions and the settings that we might need to work with it. In this case here, what I want to do is lay out a servo motor. I want to move this piece out a certain distance and along a particular axis. Now to do this, what I'm going to do is apply a velocity motor and we can go through and work with this. We can change our definition to define either the position, the velocity or the acceleration. We also have different options for the magnitude, but for this one, we'll just go ahead and keep it as a constant. And I know how far I want this assembly to move out in my case. So I know where I want it to open to. We'll just give that a quick value. It's something I can play around with later. And the idea here is now, instead of me just dragging things around, what I can do is instead set up an analysis to do this. So this analysis takes the mechanisms over a particular time frame with it using those certain drivers. So in this case, what we'll do is use that servo motor that I just went through and defined. And we'll have that go through and run and essentially defining motion over a certain time frame. And we'll let that run for a minute. And after we've run that analysis here, we can have the system tell me if there was any issues. In this case, we're good to go. And once it's run, we have the ability to play back through that analysis so we can see an animation that we have tied to that. So we can play that from a real time speed, we can speed it up or slow it down, zoom in on a particular area if we'd like to. We could even take an animation for that and get capture a movie of it. So if I wanted to share that analysis animation off with a colleague, very easy to do as well. I can also take measurements of the other values that we want to see. For example, here we might want to know what the measurement from pin to pin as we move through that analysis is. Let's go ahead and take a point from the top of the clevis and run that through its analysis. Can even get a graph of those different values. And this one in particular is pretty simple. You can get more complex as we go along here. But what I can see now is at particular time frames exactly what that distance is. Okay, so that's a good look at how the analysis and motion works from the subassembly level. We can go ahead and stop back here into the full scale assembly as well. And now we can take a look at how that process works with all the different components that we're working with here. Now, same as we did before, let's go ahead and set up an analysis over a given time frame. We'll apply the same actuator motor that we defined earlier. And with that, we'll simply tell it where to start from. And what it'll do is run through that full range of motion until one of our constraints that we have defined in our components runs and runs out and tells the analysis to stop. And once it does stop, we'll, go, we'll then go through and look at the different values. We can take different measurements of the things that we're concerned with. In this case, I want to check the angle of my hinge. I want the system to tell me how far that it's opening at that point. And we can simply select on the axis there. And we're good to go. Now, we're going to take that hinge angle, measure it throughout its range, 
and then finally give me a graph of those values. So what you can see is that it actually pulls in first before being released. So is that right? Is it wrong? Well, we're right within Creo. We can just simply just go back and change that if we need to just as fast. All right, so now let's go ahead and close that assembly back up and add in a little bit more complexity here down by our latch. So this latch is more of a cam situation where we want it to, to grab the outside surfaces of that hook, the surfaces of the pin, and we want to enable lift off here. So whenever we move that pin, we want the latch to move out of the way here. All right, so if I move that turbine, you know, how are the other components going to react? Well, in that case here, we can go ahead and move that. We can see that the latch moves out of the way. And that's really how it would probably work out in the real world. So that's definitely seeming like it's doing what we want it to there. It's having a proper interaction between those two parts. And once we have that up, we can go ahead and rerun back through the analysis to see how that's going to work. All right, so we can see that the latch moves out of the way just fine. It looks like we might need to add in a limit there as well to make sure that the latch stops, but that's a quick and easy fix to do as well. And from there, you can simply just go back through, look at any points throughout that analysis. And another very useful feature that we have here is called a trace curve, like I mentioned earlier. So suppose that the bottom of that pin, where it goes, is very important. I want to make sure that it clears something, or maybe I want to even build something around that, like a slot. Well, after we run that analysis, we can go ahead and generate a curve that's going to follow right along that path. So it's easy to go back and inspect it. And what you could do then is go ahead and build off that curve, something like a follower or a slot for that pin, or you could just build out some other geometry and make sure that it's not going to interfere there. So these are all capabilities that we work with, again, just using that mechanism design capability. All right, so before going any further here, what I want to do here is just stop and see if we have any questions. I'm not sure, Rob, if you have anything that's come in or anything um, that you want to drop in. If anyone's watching and you have any questions on what I covered there, definitely feel free to drop that in the chat. Right. I don't believe we have anything right now, so we can go ahead and keep moving on to some of the more mechanism dynamics capabilities here. So again, this is where we're starting to take into account these different forces. Anywhere where we might have things breaking, we want to take into account a lot of other variables here as well. So we're going to be using all these motions and now simulating the forces that are created by those different components moving. And then we'll study them to make sure that they're going to work correctly. So now this mechanism dynamics option is taking into account real world behavior and building it right into the design things like springs, where you might want to define a pitch or a strength or a size. The system fully understands how things like that work. You can understand stored force, release force, bounce back. Works similarly with other mechanisms as well. And now what we're doing here is really true kinematic analysis. Take into account your position, your velocity, acceleration. Build that all into context for your different parts and really a lot of different features and parameters to take into account here. So you can see something like this, even just a basic system like you're seeing here, it has a lot of different things to take into account. Springs, dampers, contacts, friction that's happening, what kind of forces are you going to get from that? Understands that and allows you to look at how that's going to come into a play. Now our mechanism dynamics option or MDL is doing all that work for us. And when it's done, we're able to share that off with different graphing capabilities, see what's the torque on this head pin, or see at certain positions, what is an acceleration or velocity, anything that you might need to check there. It's gonna look at things like reaction forces that you're getting with different loads and torque and graph all that out. And once you gather all that information, be able to share it out, share animations, tabular outputs, a lot of different options in that point. And from there, the next logical step after you know what type of forces that you're getting is taking them over into your different tools, things like your simulation or your high fidelity analysis that you can do in Creo. That's just a click away as well. So go ahead and share those off and start to get into more of a structural analysis. It also works well with things like behavior modeling, which would help you to see based on the forces that you're collecting exactly how thick a particular section might need to be in your model, or even the other direction, you know, how thin can we make this part, but still stay within a certain factor of safety and have things functioning the way that we need to. 
It also works with MathCAD, which is a digital engineering notebook that we have to perform calculations and manage your design intent. So if you're doing calculations over there, or you want to push your results and document them in MathCAD, you can do that as well. And really, at the end of the day, we're doing all this to build out a virtual product analysis. Take all these different things into consideration and really start to work towards the most optimal design that we can there. And what I can do now is switch back over into our design and walk us through a little bit about what more of these dynamics capabilities would look like. So let's go ahead and move into that now. So not just the motions and how things move, but starting to consider forces here. So let's work back here with one of our actuators. So instead of what we did earlier with a servo motor running this, maybe this one is spring loaded. That's pretty often how things like these actuators are built. And with that, there's a lot more that we have to consider. So we can go through and set this up here. And it'll start by turning on our endpoints. We want to add in a spring between these two endpoints here. Once you have that laid out, you have a lot of options for the strength of the spring, the uncompressed length. The system actually builds me a spring right on top of what we're working with here. And again, this isn't just some static piece. You have a lot of options for changing the diameters, how you want it to look. So now whenever we start to drag that actuator around, what you'll be able to see is that the spring is able to react for this. So we can preview this here, what that's going to look like. You see what it'll do is actually compress and uncompress. And with that, it's applying a certain force. And with that force, what you can do is utilize that over in your analysis and create an entirely new scenario for your assembly. Right, with that added in, we can, instead of the servo pushing the door open and having the assembly open, we can instead now use this spring that we built. And it'll look uh, really essentially the same, same interface as before. For setting up the analysis, you can shorten up the time frame and just show me what happens there. All right, now from here, we can go through and add in a little bit more complexity. So this spring, it's not just the compression. We also want to take into account things like friction. There's a lot of different parameters that we can change there. For this one in particular, we're going to add in our coefficient of restitution, essentially allowing our spring to reach a steady state by the end of its motion. And we can see exactly what that effect of that restitution has on our analysis. So just quickly go back, run through that analysis again. And at the end of the, comp the uncompressing, what it's going to do is rebound a little bit. And that's due to the parameters that we changed for it. Once we have that playback, we can look through, see at any time slice, slow it down, share it off as a movie. And we can still use our analysis and take different measurements as well. So we can take a look through here again, uh, look at the position. But now with our new spring system, we can see how that measurement changes, taking into account the new forces. So once we run that, what we can do is take a look at the graph here. And we can see that initial uncompressing. It's fairly nonlinear. And then we can see that bounce at the end of the cycle as well. And at the end, it settles out into a steady state. And now from here, we can do the same thing. But instead of position, what I want to look at is the loads. So what are the loads going to be on the spring from that motion? Well, we'll take that analysis, graph it up, take any values from that, and then share it off how we need to, and just as easy. And once we're happy with the analysis that we've run, we can go ahead and take that back into the full assembly. So now what we have is that spring here inside of our system. We can go ahead and rerun through that full scale analysis back in our full assembly. First thing I'll do here is remove the servo that we started with earlier. Don't need that now that we have our spring added in. And now we can take a step back here and rerun it. All right, now let's look at the animation here. We can see that the spring is the one forcing that latch open. And after that, it's pushing the turbine assembly out. Next step would probably be to make that latch as the starting mechanism for that process. But again, once we go through that analysis, we can go through and take measurements. And with that, a lot of different options as well. All right, another feature that we have is the ability to display arrows right along the sources of these loads. So these are helping to give us information on the direction of the load, as well as the relative magnitude. Makes it very visual for us. We can also see a graph of those loads moving for the whole mechanism and how those are changing over these certain time frame that we set. So now not only graphing this here, but whenever we do the playback, let's also go ahead and show those spring loads. And what you'll see here is whenever we go back through and play this is you'll see these arrows appear here as well. 
So it'll play through the animation that we're looking at here. And once it's playing that, it'll see the direction is changing as well as the magnitude changing as well. So it's very clear to see as that mechanism is functioning exactly where those max loads are occurring and how they're changing. It's a very visual process for that. All right, once we've gone through and understood how we built out the mechanisms, the dynamics that are driving them, we would then take all the different connections and forces and use them over into our simulation studies. So what I want to do is select the piece that we want to simulate and calculate the loads at the start, the end, and also a few other different forces that we might want to take into account. Maybe the maximum loads or at particular points in time. You know, for our study here, could be at particular points in time that we're interested in here. So say, for example, for example, we want to know at 0 0.5 seconds what our loads are. We can see that as well. And you can see all everything that's listed out here for different loads, connection forces, moments. You can really pick and choose exactly which ones that you want to use there. And once you've decided on that and you pick which ones that you want to take, you go ahead and export those out. And now they've been stored into the model as part of this piece. And to see what I'm talking about here, we can go ahead and open this part up here and do a very quick structural simulation here over using Creo Simulate. Now, this is one of our FEA tools from within Creo. You can see those forces that we got from our mechanisms. Very easy to go through here, retrieve them, and again, really truly starting to take us from end to end. So we designed the part, we designed the assembly, put it into motion, applied our loads and forces, and after we study those forces, just take them over here into your simulate and start and really understand whatever situation that you want. In our case here, we'll just run that through a quick standard static analysis using the loads that we brought in. Obviously, a lot of different capabilities over in Simulate. We're really just showing the idea here of going from start to finish. Right. And once it runs through that quick study that we set up for it, we can go ahead and take a look at the results that we're getting here. All right. And then using those loads, using the stress values, using the displacement, and even animating on those different stress values, really go through and interrogate the model even further. All right, so that's the process here of working with both mechanism design and mechanism dynamics. So all fully integrated into what we do with Creo Parametric. All right, so that's just a quick look through there. Again, lots of other things that we could really dive into in that case, but really just wanted to walk us through an example of what that would look like there, right from within the rest of the design environment of Creo. So with that, I can pass it over to you, Rob, and see if we have any questions or anything that uh, you can provide any more insight around. Oh, this was excellent. This was uh, very detailed and also um, informative and helpful. So great job as always. And um, I hope that uh, I'm positive that our participants today got a lot out of this. If you have any questions regarding any of the capabilities of Creo, in addition to what you saw today, you can reach out to us at info at 3hti.com. And that email will come to me and come to a couple other people on our team. Or you can respond to the emails that were sent to you inviting you to this webinar or any previous webinar. When you reply to those, they come directly to me and we can get your questions answered or we can even set up a uh, specific demo of Creo based on what your specific use and needs are. So once again, Paul, I wanna thank you for helping us out today and I wanna wish everybody a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holiday season to everybody. Take care and we will see you in 2023.